Hey guys, today we are actually starting a new unit and we are going to be looking at imperialism and the US post-World War I. Um, so if we're thinking like big like timeline of American history, we are right here. So industrialization, our last unit was focused here. So you can see that there is a little bit of overlap in terms of the time period, but the focus of the topics we talk about will be different. Okay. So, okay. So what exactly is imperialism? I'm sorry, a little bit of the slide is getting cut off by my face, but I'll explain. Um, so imperialism is when one country is exerting power and influence over other nations. And this can be done in a variety of different means. It can be through controlling the economy. It can be having political influence and being in charge of the government. It can be through military force, or it can even be cultural, which would be like spreading your religion in order to have control over another nation. Um, so in the very, very late 1800s into the first few decades of the 1900s, we see the U.S. start to participate in imperialism. And so the picture here, it was a pretty common image to see with the U.S. bald eagle spreading its wings all across the globe, um, showing the U.S. starting to exert power outside of our own borders. So imperialism is a term that you will hear in a lot of different historical contexts. Um, it's a really big topic in world history. Um, so in world history, you would learn about mostly European countries, uh, Great Britain in particular, uh, going out and controlling nations in places like Africa and Southeast Asia, Pacific Islands and Australia. In US history, it's the same idea of going out um, around the globe exerting power, but the areas we're focusing more on are going to be in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. So more on smaller islands than on big countries like in Africa, for example. Okay, so what leads to American imperialism? Because that's our focus, is the US imperialism. Um, there's a few different factors. The first is industrialization. Uh, so these entrepreneurs and these capitalists were seeking new markets for their goods. They needed more people to sell to. They wanted to make more money as capitalists always do. And so imperialism and having control in other countries and influence in other countries was a great way to get your products to have uh, more markets. And the second key piece is a desire to expand uh, during much of our early history in the US, we uh, there was something called Manifest Destiny, which you probably learned about in eighth grade, if you remember, um, which was the, the goal to get all the way to the West Coast. Um, so stretching all the way out to California. After doing that, um, you know, we still wanted more control. We still wanted more power. We still wanted more land. And so the desire to expand didn't just end once we reached the West Coast. Um, and that's when we start to look outward beyond our borders to the islands that surround us. The third key piece is American exceptionalism, which is a kind of complicated idea that we're gonna look more at um, throughout this unit, but it's the idea that the US and our ideas and our beliefs and our culture and our religions are superior to others and that it's our almost duty to spread those things around the world um, to other countries that maybe don't have Christianity or democracy. Um, whether or not American exceptionalism and that idea of trying to spread democracy and Christianity to other countries, whether or not that's a good thing is something that is debated and has been debated throughout most of our history. And there was a group that really opposed imperialism because of that. Um, and they were called the American Anti-Imperialist League. And they believed that imperialism violates consent of the governed. That's a kind of fancy phrase that you may have heard before, maybe not. Um, essentially what it means is that people who are being governed, people that um, are part of a government, that they need to give consent 
to that government. They need to agree. So like in America right now, we agree to be living in a representative democracy. We agree that we're going to vote in our officials and they're going to take office and they're going to represent us. If we don't agree and consent to that, um, it's a problem. And so the American Anti-Imperialist League said, if we go out and we exert influence and control over these other nations, well, we're violating that key principle of, of democracy, right? Um, the second point and reason why um, this group was opposed to imperialism is because it's not democratic. If we're forcing our will and our government on another country, then they're not having choice and they're not getting to have the agency and who's governing them. So it kind of ties in with the first point, but it's a little bit different. And the last point here is that this group really favored isolation. Um, and isolationism just means that it's when a country is focused on themselves and when they're trying to be self-sufficient and they don't want to get involved in foreign um, problems, foreign wars, um, foreign relations. They just want to stay isolated and keep to themselves. So this group thought that the U.S. didn't need to be involved with the rest of the world. We could just stick to ourselves. Our next point, and this is probably one of the biggest, probably the biggest event of American imperialism because it had so many um, effects on for the US in terms of territory growth. And that was the Spanish-American War. So this was a very, very short war where Cuba was result, revolting against Spain so Spain controlled Cuba and the Cubans said, no more, not today. We're going to take control back of our own of our own nation and we want independence. And eventually the U.S. joins this war, one, because we really supported the Cubans. There was a lot of coverage in the press and in the media about what Spain was doing to suppress the revolts, and they were using some pretty gruesome and violent tactics to do that. And so the American people were really rallying behind the Cubans and wanted them to have independence. And the second reason that really sparks us joining this war is because we had a battleship that was pretty mysteriously sunk. It's still not, uh, we're not really sure even today what exactly happened, why it was sunk. Um, but there, you know, there were suspicions that it, it was Spain that sunk that battleship. So we joined the war on behalf of the Cubans. And it was an incredibly short war. It only lasted a few months, but it was enough time to really launch Teddy Roosevelt into the spotlight. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, he's pictured to the right here. He is largely known as one of America's greatest presidents. Uh, he did a lot to help the environment and he grew our military and um, he was president in the early 1900s. And it was this war that really made people notice him. And so after the Spanish-American War, he becomes vice president and then moves after that into being that the president. Okay, uh, continuing with the Spanish-American War, the biggest effect that we see after the Spanish-American War in terms of imperialism is that the amount of territories that the U.S. controls or has influence over really increases. Um, so we take control of the Philippines. That's like one of the first things that happens during this war. And we keep control of it until the mid-1900s in 1946. Um, this is also when we take control of Hawaii. So we annex Hawaii in 1898, so like right away after this war. And then Hawaii eventually does become a state, but not until much later in 1959. Um, and then we also take control of several other smaller islands throughout the Caribbean and the Pacific, such as Puerto Rico and Guam. And those are still U.S. territories today. Um, and we're going to talk more about those probably later in this unit. Um, Hawaii is the only one thus far that has become a state. A big reason for that is because there were a lot of white Americans who did go to Hawaii and did settle in Hawaii. Um, so that was a big factor in why they did eventually gain statehood. Um, but Puerto Rico 
has not thus far, but maybe one day. Here's a map showing where all of these territories are during imperialism and who was controlling the various territories. So the arrows are pointing out to the places that the US takes control over. Um, so you can see Guam is over here. Um, we've got Hawaii right here. Um, Puerto Rico is over here. So like I said, there's still a lot of debate going on right now and has been going on about whether or not Puerto Rico should become a state or whether maybe they should have independence. Because um, right now, Puerto Rico um, has, you know, they're not represented in our Congress, but um, the U.S. does decide a lot of Puerto Rico's like environmental policies and the way that they're governed. Um, and they don't have a voice in that. So there's a lot of debate about whether or not that should be changed. Okay, last thing here, some of the overall impacts and effects of imperialism for the U.S. The first thing is that the U.S. emerges as a world power. Um, we become really the most powerful nation in the world at, um, at this point in history, and this is both economically and militarily. One of the reasons why we become so powerful militarily is because of Teddy Roosevelt, who I talked about a couple slides ago. He had something that he referred to as big stick diplomacy, which was um, the quote that he would say was, uh, speak softly, but carry a big stick. And that basically meant that we should have a, we should always be trying to be diplomatic and be peaceful and use our words but to have a massive military to back you up and to kind of always have that in the backs of people's minds so that they know that if things go south, like the U.S. is not to be messed with. Um, so he, he played a big role in us really emerging as this world power. And so we become really involved on the global stage. A big part of big stick diplomacy was the U.S. kind of being like a police force throughout the Americas, um, in the Caribbean, in Latin America. So yeah, uh, some big changes for the U.S. as a whole, becoming really powerful and really influential. Um, and we get this power economically, even though like we didn't have as much territory as some of the European countries who were involved in imperialism. Um, Great Britain definitely controlled more land, but we still end up emerging as a major world power nonetheless. Um, so thanks guys for tuning in. If you need to go back and watch any of this so you can flesh out your notes, please do. And have a wonderful, wonderful day.